community. I'm extremely excited. We have a very special guest, Sedel Sierra. She is a woman of crypto. She's the founder of the Digital Wealth Group out of Australia that's done incredible things. She's brought in thousands of students to crypto as a whole, many of them into Hex and Pulse Chain. She's part of the Seeds of Greatness project, retired by 30. By 32, she already had an eight figure well. She's even a best selling author with All Time High. It's on Amazon right now. She's it. She's the business. We're very blessed to have her not only on the podcast today, but in our ecosystem as a whole. Could not be happier. I want to thank her so much for her time, and I hope you guys get as much out of this as I did. Let's run it. And now, on the way in with Walrus, Miss Sidel Sierra. Miss Sidel, I don't think anyone has done more for the community that people are unaware of than probably you and your guys over there. For the people who haven't had a chance to interact and, and do some of the courses and cool things you guys do, which is incredible on the education side, um, do you want to maybe tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and what DWG has done for, again, the community that probably does, hasn't realized it yet? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, interestingly, my brother and I actually um, founded Digital Wealth Group about seven years ago because we were seeing so many new investors entering this space that were getting totally wrecked. And we just sort of looked at each other and said, you know, we're doing something right. You know, we're, we're making good gain. We're, we're entering this market safely. We're not getting uh, wrecked in the market or scammed out of our money. We're not handing our money over to third parties and we have a system that works and maybe we could share this. So we started, we started basically helping people driving to people's homes, uh, hosting meetups on the weekend and like library, how to open a crypto wallet type things and whiteboard uh, in the living room. Yeah. Basically, and we would go, we would bring up libraries. Um, can we borrow your whiteboard? And, uh, you know, do you have like a PowerPoint presentation set up that we could use? And uh, and then off we went and would have rooms of, you know, four, five, six people and would, would help them out for like a day, uh, get set up. And then one thing led to another and it was, hey, you know, go talk to these guys, go talk to these guys. And at the time, there was just no one doing it. There was no one helping anyone. Uh, information was hard to find. You know, you couldn't just jump on YouTube and there was a thousand instructional videos, you know, like there are now. Uh, and also questionable, like what content is actually trustworthy and, and who do you follow in this space? So people got wind of this, this uh, Aussie brother and sister that were helping people and uh, off we went. So we started doing that very naturally. And then all of a sudden uh, we were invited to speak on larger stages, 60 investors, 100 investors turned to 500 investors. Then we were starting to go all around the world and speaking on stages and inspiring people about this asset class called cryptocurrency that at the time, many people still hadn't even really heard about. And I still remember conversations where I'd be talking about Bitcoin and people would say, what's Bitcoin? You know, so that's really how far we have seen this space evolve. Now it's obviously a household name, um, but it's been an amazing journey and it started in Bitcoin and over the time we've, we've taken people deeper into, into the crypto sphere, right down to DeFi, right down to um, the, all the options and, and things that are coming into this space where people can get exposure to where they may never have ever had the confidence to venture into. I think it's really important that you guys like started with that very hands-on approach because like for so many people, that's what it takes. You know, they, they can hear about the gains, they can hear about this, but it, it's just an entirely different vernacular it's an entirely different vocabulary uh, you know all these things are, are are very you know even again bitcoin themselves you know I, i've kind of kind of joked a few times people are uncomfortable with bitcoin because they don't understand it they're uncomfortable because when they start about bitcoin they realize they don't understand any of this and then they get really uncomfortable so uh it can definitely take a lot of that that nurturing early on to get people going i think most definitely and you know i i say to new investors i say you know overwhelm is the opportunity and that's one of the taglines i say all the time in, in digital wealth group i say overwhelm is the big opportunity and crypto really gives to you what you give to it and the more you dig into this space the more you see that it, it really is an opportunity like anything else we've ever seen before uh not from just a financial gains perspective but from a utility perspective but many people don't understand that so we've been able to take your everyday person, your everyday investor, the school teacher to a retiree, baby boomer, uh, you know, to someone who's just never, ever even pretty much opened an email account in their life. And we're bringing them into this space. And we've brought thousands and thousands of students right through into this fascinating world of crypto. But we have, you know, dug deeper into those layers, not just Bitcoin, you know, as people think crypto is just buying Bitcoin and it absolutely isn't. 
So where did you guys kind of evolve from Bitcoin into some of the other assets and then from some of the other assets into things like Hex and Pulse Chain? What was y'all's sort of a journey there, you and your brother? Yeah, so we actually started talking about Hex uh, about, you know, pretty much when it launched and we were onboarding members and talking about the opportunity or the value proposition that Hex can offer. Uh, also, we very much aligned with Richard Hart's values and uh, things like delayed gratification and and doing crypto the right way and what is crypto for? And it's about self-custody. It, it's about, you know, um, playing the patience game. Longer pays better. So whilst all the noise out there was promoting all these get rich quick scams, we were talking about real wealth creation and true wealth creation. Wealth that can be handed down for generations to come and you potentially retirement in two, three, four years, not not in one month, which which we would see a lot of shiny object stuff going around. So we, we started introducing people into the world of Hex and into the world of DeFi and that, you know, Ethereum isn't the only blockchain out there. Um, of course, Pulse Chain coming in was was a huge part of our uh, narrative where we're, we're sort of, ex, you know, bringing people on to explore this new chain because of our passion for what crypto can really do. So we got so many, we've got thousands of students into Hex and into Pulse Chain by simply introducing them, just simply opening the door and saying, did you know this actually existed? Did you know that there isn't a better alternative, faster, cheaper alternatives to the Ethereum chain? Uh, did you know you can be at the beginning of incredible infrastructure and infrastructure that's getting built out at a, at a rapid pace? And so we opened the door to, uh, to thousands of investors to start looking at this this offering that perhaps would only be pulled out if you were sort of deep in the crypto, you know, <laughs> epicenter, I call it. And uh, so we had many students actually generate millions of dollars actually from Hex alone. And, and obviously the remaining Richard Hart offerings um, from that, you know, ecosystem are yet to sort of come to their full fruition because we have a bull market, a full bull market to play out here. Um, but I believe, you know, people are positioned into this market for, you know, potentially some great, some great outcomes, um, not only just from a financial gain, but from a utility perspective too. I have to be one that has to be careful because I get, uh, I'm sure like yourself, I have such romanticism with the tech that I'm like the utility, utility. I'm wanting to use all these things. And it, it can be overwhelming when you're like multi-sig and, you know, you know, delay staking, move this road to multi-chain, all these things. So it's... Uh, yeah, most definitely. And we talk about utility and people see that it can do A, B, C, and there's these other options. But what I believe that it really does, which is why I'm so, feel so inspired to talk about Pulse Chain, to talk about Hex talk about this whole ecosystem is because it provides in my opinion it provides hope for people it provides another option perhaps we've always known our legacy system our banking system to be the way it is but all of a sudden you put in the hands of new investors who have never entered crypto you all of a sudden open their minds to the possibilities then you have these penny drop moments then you have these moments where people feel inspired then you have a moment where people have choice and they have hope and then they can go you know what Maybe I don't actually have to be subjected to whatever is going to happen in my bank account or whatever's going to happen on a macroeconomic scale. Maybe I all of a sudden have these more sovereign options that I can use for myself. And not only that, I'm going to go tell 10 of my friends about because I cannot believe that I can do ABC through crypto. And the whole time these investors thought it was only just about buying a bit of Bitcoin and that's it. So that's what I absolutely love. The utility opens eyes. It opens doorways it gives people hope in a world where you know maybe particularly around our finances that hope is hard to find absolutely so how how have you guys done as far as um sort of progressing people along so it's like something like pulsing do you find it um maybe just because of your guys' expertise when it comes to the education the comfortability with them that it's easy to sort of get them in and show them something new i think that's something that the community as a whole challenge you know is, is fairly challenged with because it, it's sort of difficult to get people sort of once they're in the ecosystem i think people will find the cool dApps things like ll they love hex um what, what is, what's been the most kind of successful thing for you guys as far as getting people from say other ecosystem or sort of a blue chip only where it's like okay i get wallets on btc and e into actually using and playing with some of this DeFi uh, that's on pulse chain yeah, um, yeah, great question because a lot of people, I mean, admittedly, most investors entering into crypto are on CFI, they're on centralized finance. It, it probably got their money's just sitting on an exchange and then they think, hey, that's, that's I'm, I'm in crypto, I'm in this market. And they say, well, how about we come over here and we'll show you ABC, we'll show you these steps to enter into a, a whole new um, offering, a whole new range of offerings for you to, to explore. 
So we actually take the new investor who knows hardly anything about crypto. Sometimes they've entered for the first time. And we show them step-by-step step of how to firstly diversify um, by holding different assets, but why we should diversify. And then we give them instructions like how to actually use this technology for their advantage, for their own portfolio. So how can you have everything in your custody and be earning yield, um, be borrowing against your assets uh, like liquid loans? And you know maybe you can actually borrow against your assets and then reinvest back into the ecosystem and pennies start to drop for people's minds. So a lot of the time we demonstrate and we explain what the implications can do. And then people obviously love, look at that and they go, I actually want to use that. How do I do that? And then we provide the step-by-step -step training um, very much related to their actual investment portfolio. And then they can go and apply it themselves. And then we have, of course, one-on-one -on -one coaching. So the coaching then walks them through that process and they see it once or twice and they can go do it themselves. Yeah, it's beautiful there. What, what's some of the things you guys do to kind of coach some of these guys around, um, like looking at it from a portfolio perspective when it comes to crypto? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we talk a lot about diversification and we, we try to remove people away from the scattergun approach of, hey, just invest into 200 coins and hope for the best, you know, and we do have people that arrive at our door and say, <laughs> say they're, they're hoping for one of them and they got 50 bucks on, on 200 coins and we're, you know. So we have so to was like going to roulette and being like, all right, I want to put yeah. two chips on everything with the right number and just <laughs> on every it. table. And I'm just going to watch every table at once. And, uh, it's impossible. Right. So, uh, the first thing that we get students to think about is to build a foundational portfolio. So, uh, at the core, you're going to hold anywhere from eight to 15 coins max, and you're going to be, have exposure to the top, what we call growth sectors or decentralized finance, new blockchain technology. So they might hold, for example, like Pulse Chain is one of the, the cryptos that we talk heavily on, of course, new blockchain, new layer one. And then we talk about, you know, liquid loans. We talk about PulseX, Hex, and then we also include some of the other growth sectors, some AI, some metaverse. So we have a bit of balance in there. Then we have a, a slice that's allocated to more of a conservative play, um, you know, for example, holding a bit of Ethereum uh, or, and Bitcoin. So there's a percent there. So once we have that foundational portfolio locked, we, we, we like to get through that first uh, that first step. And the second step then is what can we do with this portfolio now? How can we scale it? So one of our big focuses is looking at the options to scale. Where's the low hanging fruit? And that's how we can then bridge in one step at a time to teach people that there is more than what you, there is more than meets the eye to your foundational portfolio. In other words, we can make it productive. How do we make it productive? How do we start earning yield? How do we maximize and use the tools to elevate? Uh, and the end goal is how do we stop bringing outside capital into our portfolio and just be be rotating yield around our portfolio and growing and scaling like that? How do we borrow against our existing assets? Uh, so there's there's so many things and people just new investors have never they cannot believe this this infrastructure exists. They just simply can't believe it. So I, I love that penny drop moment for investors and then they go tell tell ten other people and then you've got you know you've got. Uh, 10, 20 retirees or 10, 20, you know, um, everyday employees working away, doing full-time jobs, telling their aunties, their uncles, and and everyone brings someone into the ecosystem. And, and that's this huge ripple effect that we've seen through Digital Wealth Group. Yeah, that, that, that stuff's so powerful to see that empowerment on people. The, the you know, I, th I think that's something that goes, it's very, very cultural. Like there's so many places where people feel whether, you know, they feel either, you know, corruption in some of the institutions, they feel like a vote doesn't count, um, you know, all the sort of, again, cultural things we see in the West, the idea that like, these are my keys, this is my stuff, only what I click, what happens, like, there's, there's I think there's a lot of powerfulness that, that, that really comes from self-custody. I, I think it's underrated how, it, when, when you coach a lot of people and you see some of the people really bite into it, for some of us, it can, can seem almost as a default, you know, if you, you know, if you're kind of surrounded by people who are, you know, more libertarian on, on that crypto side, but when you're doing a lot of onboarding, I think you get a chance to see some of that empowerment that comes from like self-custody and responsibility. I think it's super powerful for so many people. It is, yeah. It gives people a financial plan B. It gives people an, another option. It, out of I say we talk about self-sovereignty and money mindset and money that, you know, money is at the root of so many people's stresses. And I say, well, what if we could give ourselves some options? What if we could place ourselves you know, in the in the fastest appreciating asset in the world, um, in where all the innovation is happening, where the best infrastructure is being built out. How do we go there? And so that's why we've bought 
and introduce so many people over to Pulse Chain to this whole ecosystem that is doing exactly that where innovation is exploding at a historic rate compared to to other developments in DeFi. So it, it's just lovely. It's amazing to see and, and it really walks the walk. It's not just talking the talk. You actually, you see it all happening in, in real time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you know, get a, you know, the L team, like not only, you know, people just, they see L, but they don't see, you know, as much of the work with Oracles and like multi six and the stuff that we've had to build its infrastructure around, you know, you know, we, we see, you know, people talking about validators. So it, we, we definitely love, you know, getting to see all that, all that, that capital infusion and new investors come in, but it, it's really interesting to see again, like you can see the wheels turning on this thing. Like you're, there's a, there's a very much, there's a lot of intimacy because the community is so close and all these things are being built out. Like no one knows who Infura is. They never, you never even hear about nodes if you're on ETH. Over here, it's like, man, you guys know Gamma, right? Yeah, hit up Gamma. Gamma's the one that runs that. Or, oh, that's Alex from Hedron. Yeah, just go hit up Alex. Like, I think some of that is, you know, again, some of that's just from the time spent that from some of us here. But um, is that something that you notice from some of the investors that come to Pulse Chain? If they spend some time, they start looking at, you know, all the community engagement things that they can see how close some of the community is here on the chain? Yeah, most definitely. So I guess the tribalism is one of the huge drawing factors as well, because it's backed by the support of that tribalism. So, you know, it's like a fortress and fortresses don't fall over easily. So um, then that's once once you're in it, people start to discover all of the, the, the links between all of the different people and all of the infrastructure that's being built. There's a, there's a common thread. And that is, it's all very much this philanthropic, uh, building a better ecosystem, building better crypto experience. And that's what I pe- I think people tap into that and they, they feel that when they come into that ecosystem and that adds to even more excitement, more, um, you know, I guess loyalty as well, like more engagement. Yeah. Someone from the community one time, we, we were in a, in a small chat, we were talking and he was like, uh, man, the tribalism in crypto is horrible. I, I can't believe it gets so extreme. Also, watch your mouth about my tribe. <laughs> <'Cause> that, <laughs> exactly. Because that, you, you know, you see, you see how crazy it is. He's like, also, I, yeah. I get it though. These are my people. Like, <laughs> that there's certainly a lot of tribalism, and that that can actually be one of the you know such big bullish factors, like the Dogecoin army and all of these sorts of things. And you know, the Dogecoin army, I mean, that pumps off of sentiment. It pumps off people feeling good and people feeling optimistic. Um, and it pumps like every everything else does if you have a lot of optimism behind it. So when you have consensus that something will do right, it often does because everyone is thinking the same way. Yeah, we see that with, with like TA, right? We have some of those like emergent properties where, hey, this this uh, pattern does this thing. Well, if everybody agrees and they think it's going to go up, they start to buy and it goes up. It starts to be, a, you know, it's kind of self-fulfilling in some ways. Most definitely. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, we've um, we've onboarded thousands into the e- ecosystem. I say onboarded, I say introduce, introduce people, open their eyes to this platform. Uh, opportunities. I just love seeing that opportunity that someone would never have got exposure to because, that, you know, we can have all this great infrastructure, but where is the education? And I think sometimes we need to come back to that foundation and look at that education and look at all the fundamentals because so many people don't, they just simply maybe don't understand it. So there's that bit of a gap and, uh, and that's, that's that gap that gets constantly filled. And then you, once you're in that gap and you've crossed that gap, you see the whole ecosystem and it's such a thriving ecosystem and, and that's where it becomes even more exciting. I had someone who, who we were, we were going through and setting up a vault and, just a handful of things with it all. So, um, you know, we were kind of going back and forth, opening and closing. Um, he had to, what did we have to do? We, had, we, we moved some PLS to another wallet, probably made like seven or eight transactions. We're sitting here on the call. He came in primarily through Hex. He has a few things on certain exchanges. So he he's about as savvy as you'll get for someone who's in fun in a funny way, almost done nothing. Like he, he he's held his Hex. He's never staked. He was like, I, I just didn't know how I didn't want to mess with it. So he literally just basically had Hex that just, it just sits and he's happy with it. It's forked. He's happy with it. He, he had someone help him, uh, so that he could sacrifice and was involved in pulse chain. It's sitting in the, it was sitting in the exact same wallet. It had never moved, not a single transaction on the wallet. And so we sat down and went through this. So as we were sitting here going through some of these things, I was like, hold on one second. How many transactions did we make? And he was like, I don't know, seven. I went and pulled up. I was like, one swap right now on ETH is $48. And he was like, we started to go through an ad and we're like, I think we spent 18 cents. And so seeing even for him, like he know, like he owns both sides, right? Like he, he's someone who's even that close to it. And he realized he was like, we just wouldn't have done this. He's like, this, like this would have been a three, $400 exercise. He's like, if you told me, he, I mean, he has a, you know, five figure portfolio. So it's not like it's unreasonable, but he, he just wouldn't have, you know, like, 
probably not, man. I just want to burn. I don't want to burn three or four hundred dollars in case I don't enjoy it, don't want to play. And even for, you know, again, someone who's seen the game and touched it, the difference at four hundred dollars and eighteen cents kind of vibe. But it's the difference in people wanting to use this stuff and not use it. It's like um, what Richard Hart was talking about, and you know, people. We can sometimes be removed, especially when you've been in the crypto market for a long time and you've had good success. You can be removed from paying gas fees because you're like, oh, click, that's just how it is. And we get so familiar with it. But just because something is just how it is, isn't, isn't really how it should be. And there should be better alternatives. And, you know, like there has been what over a hundred million dollars of, of gas fees paid from hexagons on the, on the Ethereum network. And it's huge. That is huge amounts of money that could be like, you know, Richard Hart says in the hands of actual, uh, hex holders. And, you know, it's so and then the other argument is you think about how many hours someone would work. And I was looking at those, those posts oh, alone wow. and it's an interesting thought. Someone on a minimum wage, are they going to wait, work a nine hour day, you know, to, to cover one transaction on the Ethereum chain? So this is where I love innovation. And this is one of the reasons we have onboarded and spoken so highly of Pulse Chain because it provides an alternative. And I say, well, if you're on a, on a motorway and or a freeway and you're looking at a congested high traffic, high toll fee bridge. And you look over there and it's faster. There's no traffic jams. It, it's only a few pennies to drive across there and you get there faster. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? You know, so it, it's, it's an adoption thing. So um, this is, this is, uh, this is why I love crypto because the infrastructure, the innovation, whenever there's frustration, we can lead out these amazing innovative platforms like Pulse Chain that come forward from that. And uh, exactly like your um, your friend there, it's like, why would we want to pay pay so much in those fees when and that four hundred uh, that forty dollars, you know, on on a on a crypto that's worth a fraction of a penny can be worth a lot in the future. Absolutely. So overall, on Pulse Chain, we're you know, I, I guess what you know the, where the bull run starts. I think for most people, is we kind of measure from the bottom. I think for a lot of people on the outside, um, it, it's something funny enough to, I've also talked to a few of the guys who are more uh, suit and tie, uh, Goldman Sachs, more more TradFi. They basically, they they sort of take it as like, once we hit all time highs, that to them is the bull run. Cause like, that's a very clear guarantee. And they know that they basically have a short time frame to basically make some, some gains there. So I, I know, I know again, I know from your, your background there, do you, do you think some of the ETFs and these things are gonna change the kind of shape of the bull run for the next year and a half or so. And more specifically, you know, after that kind of, how do you think it'll affect bullshit? chain? Yeah. I mean, I think firstly, Bitcoin is such a, it's such the, it's the big flag of the crypto market. It's the billboard brings in the trillions of dollars of capital and all the awareness and all that retail money. And, you know, as that cup gets full, it has an old flow effect to the broader market. And uh, that's what I love to see is that the, the stronger Bitcoin goes, there is the silver lining because ETFs, yes, bring more centralization. But the silver lining is that it also brings more capital to this market and we have more of a, an inflow. We have more of a, what I call a squeeze where we, we've got all this money pouring in. We've got volume that we never had before moving into this space. And we've also, we've, you know, we've, we've gone from retail money to opening the doors to millions of other retail investors that never would have looked at crypto that are all of a sudden looking at this space. So we now have just added a whole new avenue of retail money coming into this, uh, we, we, we could say institutional money, which is, you know, retail money essentially coming into the crypto market. And so it is an unprecedented bull run. And I do believe there'll be unpredictable things along the way. Um, but uh, I still believe we're yet to enter this bull market phase. We are entering it right now and we have a, uh, we have a strong bull market ahead of us. I just believe it'll be unprecedented like we have been speaking about for years, you know, talking about this institutional wave. Every every once in a while, I like uh, to to kind of get some framing. I went and listened to uh, Peter Schiff and Raul Powell have a debate. Uh, interesting. <laughs> I don't know if you got a chance to catch any of that. I was just I was listening in some ways, and I'm I'm still blown away by some of the things that Peter Schiff says. Now again, I, I think that he's slanted. Obviously, talk, you know, he's a bit of a gold bug, uh, but still the. And again, I think he's being slightly disingenuous, but you know, a few of the things that he's brought up about like a lack of utility or like, the, you know, a lack of value. And I'm like, man, the, the idea of non-counterfeitable value, the idea of, uh, you know, being able to essentially instantly, uh, you know, transact across the world, the, the lack of government intervention, regulation, the ability to transport, the amount of, the, you know, just some of the efficiencies, you know, it, it, it still blows me away, uh, that we, that we see that. And even now that we see the ETFs, um, 
you know, he, he still referred to that as gambling. I, I, don't, I haven't really seen it that way. I, I see that more as that true defining like guys, like, um, it's, it's here. And that's where I think the institution is really powerful. There, there's the direct inflows, but you know, state street, fidelity, fortress, uh, you know, BlackRock, like the biggest asset managers in the world are now holding this stuff where it's like, is this, is this really monopoly money at this point? Like at what point is it not monopoly money? And I, and I think that's what we're, we're seeing throughout this cycle. And I think that, that we're going to see the, the wave of people who just kind of see the, the Bitcoin logo, you know, in their portfolios, the same way they would see Apple and Nvidia and everything else. And I, I think that is going to be massively different on, on, on how much buoyancy we see in the market. Yeah, absolutely agree. And yeah, it is, it is interesting when you see comments like, oh, there's no utility and it's still like gambling. It's, I fail to see that argument after being in this space for so long. When you dive so deep into this space, it's it almost an it's almost a null point. So, if you have to like, if that's sort of like what you have left to say, right? So it's okay. It, it's not it's it's not been broken. Okay, so you can't use that argument. It's not gone to zero after fourteen years. So you lost that argument. Now we're down to like, well, it's still really backed by nothing. It's all, all right, man. Okay. All right. If that's if that's the hill you're gonna you're gonna die on, well, we're fine with it. Uh, okay. Walking away. Yep. So <laughs> yeah. So again, you kind of mentioned it there that like this is where so you kind of see the bull market around these times here where the market isn't, I guess, sort of like total risk on full uh, furnace heat up until around that we start to see some of the all time highs. Yeah, I believe so. I think you know fundamentally, if we take out the institutional piece, we haven't really entered that bull market phase based on cyclical history just yet. And we still have so many fundamental things to happen. We've got, you know, the halving event, we've got the May, you know, possible approval for the Ethereum ETFs in May. And we've got all of this sort of beginning start date expected to be more around the, you know, October, November time for this bull market to begin. So in many phases, in many regards, we are still in that pre-bull market phase from a retail level historically, but we have this institutional piece that has blown everything out of out of the water and we don't have any historical parallels to this moment. So I have been calling it a popcorn year for crypto and uh, and it really is, it's slightly unprecedented, but also keeps us on the edge of the seas. And really this is crypto. This is the volatility that we, you know, we make the gains from. And it's really just about playing it smart and staying on, on top of the news, staying on top of what's happening in this market. You know, this is not a time to be turning away. It's not a time to be I'll wait in a few months and see see where things are going. It's um it's an amazing oh. moment. <laughs> yeah, it's a, yeah. Some people go, oh, I'll check back in a few months. But it you know I say investors wait years for moments like this, and it's very exciting. You know, whilst we have all this complexity and a lot of unknowns, we still are sitting in this amazing position where we've got all of this potential. And how much of that potential will be realised is is another question. So I just think, I think it's. It's the thing we've been waiting for, the institutional movement. It's going to bring huge volume. I think the alt market is still undervalued. We're going to see, we're going to start to see some of that capital on flow into the alt market. We're going to have an, a, you know, a great altcoin rally. Um, Bitcoin is is not the indicator that this is the end of the market. So to say right now, people think it's too late to be looking at the alt market. And um, yeah, I say trade carefully and, and stay and watch closely. I think when we look at like, there's a few, like if you look at like the grayscale selling and a few other things there, it would be even, even what we see now, like the, I think we, we've underappreciated how much that extra ETF uh, inflows have really affected things because of they sort of like relieve pressure in other places that we would have, that we didn't even really notice. Like the amount of great, I think grayscale sold, I think it was averaging a billion dollars a day, like five days in a row like that. I mean, that would have, you know, if you just take away the inflows and they, they would have smoothed that out to have, you know, better order execution, but just, just like, just grayscale, like just GBTC, you would have seen those, those outflows uh, that would have dramatically changed what we have here. If you didn't have, again, this, this giant, you know, inflow from these ETFs that were uh, what three of them, I think were like the highest, highest inflow ETFs of like all time inside of like a week. So yeah. that massive inflow there, it, it has given us this idea. And I think that again, the, the idea that like the alts aren't going to run like the, like this is, this was just, a, these are just early fireworks to me. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. And, and yeah, you're right with the ETF history. I mean, uh, in 2023, something like 500 ETFs, non-crypto ETFs were launched and the total trading volume amongst all of them was 0.45 billion, you know, so. I think there's <laughs> three different Bitcoin ETFs that are all higher than that by themselves. 
on day one, it was like yeah. totally blowing that stat out of the water. Um, what was it? The they estimated that it was Galaxy Digital Assets. They estimated fourteen point four billion across one first their first year of ETFs, and just in under two months, it's it's like what under eight or something like that. <laughs> it's a uh, it's definitely I mean more than halfway there. You know, so uh, yep, under two uh... months. That's a big number to anybody, but even in financial markets, that's moving a lot of paper. That's a lot of paper moving across a lot of desks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also the question is, you know, uh, where will Bitcoin come from? And you've got these, these institutions that own so many of the media stations as well, and they want people to use their products. You know, they're going to be driving this market as much as anyone. And, you know, so there is the silver lining. I always say to investors looking to enter this space, it's like, what side of this wave do you want to be on? You know, and it's certainly not the time to be sitting on the sidelines. And I simply say, perhaps having some exposure is better than none into an asset class that has proven itself time and time again. One of the other things I think that we we haven't got a chance to see just yet, but we probably will. I think it'll really play hit like Q3 as we start to see some of the like year to date trends and funds. Well, if your allocation is no no Bitcoin. How much can you realistically be up in that fund as everyone starts to report all these private equity? But if you are one, two, three, five percent Bitcoin and you get that massive skew, um, I think that we're going to get a chance to see some of these crypto upside percentages that are going to be in traditional funds. And I think that we're going to see another strong wave as you see some year to date and it's 8% on this fund, 12%, 22. They did fantastic. 66%. Okay, that's strong. What happened there? Like, <laughs> Because they had a three percent allocation in, in that fund of Bitcoin, and then Bitcoin's up three x in their portfolio there. So I, I think that we'll even see another wave of some of, of some of this institutional money when the traditional metrics that they're used to looking at, they see them and they don't even think Bitcoin. They just see this is X Y Z fund, this is X Y Z equity, and they they see these outrageous gains from people who have been in you know the first stage of the ETFs and have seen a fifty. You know maybe by the time we get to Q three, have seen three four hundred percent returns as part of their portfolio and they just see how much it just absolutely skews. So I think that we're going to see some really interesting inflows from some of these traditional markets when we get to the like year to date numbers in Q3. Oh, definitely. And yeah, that's a, such an interesting point. And they were, I mean, they were even looking at the, we're looking at silver stats like this from years ago when you couldn't buy these sorts of things through institutions. And they were saying just the difference of holding a little bit of Bitcoin and you're just a retail, just private self custody portfolio and what that actually did and how that broke that correlation and outperformed all of your other portfolio combinations. And then now we have this and it's going to be you know documented on a wide scale and, and published. And it's certainly going to pique the curiosity of, of a whole lot more uh, institutions and corporations to come as well. Yeah, I think it'll be, I think it'll be really, really powerful to see. I, I think there's going to be a, a definite S wave to some of that. You'll see, you know, again, we kind of have this massive inflow. We'll probably have a cooling off here somewhere as you get some kind of a retrace that's you know not too dramatic and you just kind of runs out of steam and then the I think the data the, there'll be a wave of the data hitting that we'll see that big push uh, so I'm 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 very excited to see that I'm I'm excited for those phone calls hey so this this, this funds up eighty seven percent do you know what's going on with it yeah I do bud I sure do know what's going on uh, <laughs> I think that'll be fun it's different than the hey Bitcoin's at an all time high how do you get in versus like we're we're going to see like there's going to be an easy way for, you know, again, the, you know, sort of the, the, the standard white collar golf course guys that are rolling around, they'll just push. So I, I think that'll be really cool to see. Uh, but as we wrap it up here, we'll put you on the spot. Give us two different things that all the listeners should, uh, should know for this next bull run here. Uh, two different things put me on the spot. So I would say, firstly, having exposure, some exposure is better than none and be diversified across multiple growth sector areas. So don't just go for your your top hitters like your Bitcoin and Ethereum. And while some exposure into them is great, uh, you really have that huge growth potential in in the more of the the outside sectors. I'll say outside, but the more um, speculative sectors, um, growth sectors where the innovation is coming from. So your pulse chains, your hex, things like this. And my second tip is to be a contrarian. And I love, I say this to everywhere and everyone, <laughs> I say, Always be a contrarian. And when everyone's thinking the same, no one's thinking at all. So that's when you don't want to be buying at the all time highs because you're going to be locking in losses for years to come. So be look to play, always look to place maximum upside potential in front of you. They're my Absolutely. two takeaways. 
contrarian exposure though is a felony in some places so please be careful with that but i think it's good advice for the market <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so um I don't think we even got a chance to bring it up early. Do you want to give a, a little short synopsis on your book? I know it's been doing really, really well. Congratulations on it. I think it's uh, it's fantastic. Uh, uh, do you want to give everybody a little synopsis on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. I have, um, this is the book All Time High. So this was published. It is a conversational piece. So it's probably the most, you know, fireside chat that you're going to have about crypto. It's the perfect thing to give to someone who has no idea about how to get into this space, what it's about, or maybe the naysayers breaks down all your basics, all the common fears people have, and really introduces them to the power of this asset class. So it's written for beginners. And again, it's that educational piece. It's helping people to break down those barriers and to come into this incredible asset class that really does give so much. So all-time high, it's available on Amazon. Uh, you can get a Kindle version. You can order the hard copy if, you're, if you're, you like having books. And uh, yeah, and I highly suggest give it to that naysayer because they're going to have their mind shifted. So if somebody has Peter Schiff's address, let me know. We're going to send him a copy. And we're <laughs> we're going to get him warm, get him warmed up. we get a signed copy. <laughs> and then if people want to get in touch with DWG and some of the coaching and all the fantastic stuff there, or if they want to refer other people, that's something uh, that I've, I've leaned on other people for is you just, you know, if you're in the space, you get hit up a lot, especially if you have other things going on that you want to take that, you know, that time to really bring people on board that they may not have to. So DWG is, a, I think, a great resource. How, how can people kind of find and get plugged in with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So if, if you're sort of wanting someone to have proper handholding, get into this space safely where they own their own crypto, uh, exposed to those growth sectors, um, then head over to digitalwealthgroup.com.au and we have also a free training. So you can go to digitalwealthgroup.com.au forward slash free training and there's a 90 minute session in there breaking down what's happening in the market. It's current and it also has um, all about our offering, how you can get started with a private coach and and we have yes yeah, students all around the world. So doesn't matter where you're located, you can certainly get help and reach out. Fantastic. Miss Adele, you are a woman in a wonder. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate all the work the, that you've done behind the scenes. You, your brother, the DWG, DWG team as a whole. Again, I've got a chance to hang out with a, a few of the coaches. They're wonderful people to interact and work with. Uh, and we have all benefited from, from your hard work. So thank you very much for everything in the past. And thanks for hopping on and spending some time with us. Thanks so much, Laura. Thanks for today and all for listeners. And I uh, got the great work. It's it's one whole community here. So thank you so much. Cheers.